So welcome everyone. This is the 14th Telsync webinar. We're really, really glad that you joined us this morning. Uh, we have a really, really interesting presentation from Japan, from Richard Bailey and David Hammond. They are going to talk about how to um, how to design synchronous listening activities using Google Forms and Microsoft Forms. Uh, welcome. So let's get down to work. Welcome, Richard. Welcome, David. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, if you have any questions, please post your questions in the chat box. And at the end, we are going to pass these questions uh, to our presenters. Welcome. And now I'm going to disappear. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful welcome. Uh, yeah, so I guess, David, shall we go ahead? I'll start screen sharing the, uh, the slides and we can go from there. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, all right. Hello, everyone. Make sure, make sure I get the right. Uh, let's see, uh, it's been a while since I've used this one. How do I do the full? Present, top right. Oh, I got a, my things in the way. There it is, thank you. <laughs> I've been using, apparently, I'm using PowerPoint too much. So good afternoon or good evening, everyone uh, from Japan. Uh, my name is Rich Bailey. I teach at Tokai University and David. Yeah, I'm a teacher at Hokkaido University of Education. And uh, today we're going to be doing a presentation called Formal English. Uh, it was David's bad idea for the joke in the title of form, oh, Formal English. I apologize for that. Uh, focusing on how to create asynchronous listening activities using Microsoft and Google Forms. Uh, so our main goal is to not spend a lot of time on the details of our teaching, which may not be particularly useful to you in your context, but on the more general ideas of what we did and how they might be applicable to you. Because a lot of us are very busy and we have our own unique teaching situations and environments. And sometimes advice from other presenters or the teachers is not particularly useful to us. So our goal is to make it as um, useful as possible. So um, uh, this is me. Um, and this information will all be available either online or at the end. So don't panic about taking notes. Um, I'm originally from America. I've been teaching for quite some time. And I've been teaching in Japan now for 12 years. Um, and my main focus is on uh, mobile assisted language learning or using smartphones. David? All right, I don't know if anyone can see me, but I'm the invisible guy. Um, <laughs> this is not Rich talking. Uh, yeah, I'm from Portland originally. Uh, six years of teaching in junior high school. Um, and now I'm in the university uh, teaching arena. And uh, my focuses have been on textbook evaluation and uh, teaching with uh, learning management systems. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the situation in Japan because that's that affected a lot of what we had to do and it might be of interest to you. Um, so our spring semester, the beginning of the school year starts usually on April 1st or around the first week. In 2020, as the coronavirus situation was getting worse um, around the world, but also in Japan, many universities were debating about whether or not they were gonna go online. Many of them waited literally until the last minute. Um, and so we had very little time pretty much as a whole group of educators in the country to prepare to go online. Um, some of the problems, as you see on the slide, is that we do not have, Japan does not have a culture of online education. Uh, they're very, unfortunately, low tech in a lot of ways. Um, and most universities had uh, very bad LMS or learning management systems. In fact, my universities was so bad that when they started using it, it broke down because it couldn't handle the volume of the students that were accessing it. So there was a lot of scrambling, especially at the beginning of the semester. Also, a lot of teachers in Japan, because of this context, don't have a lot of experience uh, with using technology and online teaching. So it wasn't just the students and the infrastructure, it was also uh, the educators as a group. So David, I'm just gonna keep going unless you wanna sort of jump in and yeah, no, it, it was the same situation in Sapporo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, and this is this is just an interesting an interesting note that actually brought David and I together in to help each other out as a community. Someone started a Facebook group called Online Teaching Japan that grew organically from a few hundred members to now 
uh, more than 2,300. Um, it's an amazing Facebook group of English teachers that support everyone. You can post any kind of question or problem and you will immediately get uh, feedback and help. And we have members that are not necessarily in Japan now. So I would assume if you wanted to join, you'd be welcome to at this point. Um, and But what's nice is we have a Friday night social Zoom meeting where we all get together and have adult beverages and we talk about teaching in our lives. And that's where David and I met one night in a breakout room when David was in a similar situation, uh, had to teach sort of at the last minute, didn't know what to do. And I suggested that he use my book, my plan that I had developed. And he said, yes. And so we basically were sort of co-teaching at different universities, which led to us working together throughout the semester, which led us to this point. So that was sort of the interesting thing that brought us together. Uh, so the teaching context, uh, and again, this is about the class that we were dealing with. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Mine was an elective class called Vocabulary Building. I could do anything I wanted. I had used the book before, um, which, we'll, which we'll, demo, we'll, we'll introduce. And so it seemed to me an easy way to try to transition this to an online class. It was a large mixed class. It only met once a week. David? Yeah, so my class was uh, all second graders. And they were not English majors, so the, the goals of the class was just to get them into English again and to build their fluency, uh, especially in the skills of speaking and listening. Those were the two I focused on because that is just such a low point for a lot of Japanese students here in Japan, just to build confidence on their speaking and listening and uh, being able to have conversation. Uh, yeah, and I had, I had 140 students, a uh, mix of majors. And I guess one common theme is that since these were basically electives or like electives, we were free to sort of do it how we wanted. Uh, I had other classes where we had a required curriculum and the university, my department created a system for teaching, but this allowed, this class allowed me the freedom to explore and try different things. So this is the textbook that we use. Um, it's by a, a EFL Press. I believe they're based here in Tokyo. Uh, the main advantage for us is that it has Japanese support uh, from the website and other resources, but it could be used by anyone. Um, it's, it's a conversational book based on topics. Each topic has 13 questions. There's um, online recordings that go with the record, um, online trans there's transcripts that go with the online recordings, um, and you can find all that. Oop, sorry, let me go back. This is an example of what one of the units looks like. Um, with uh, the 13 questions on the left. It has multiple choice uh, answers to go with the audio recording. And on the right is an activity sheet that the students can use together. Um, and it's, it's quite a simple book, but it's a very good starting point. And I use this as the jumping off point, depending on the level of the students, to uh, encourage conversation, to sort of stimulate. It's, it's a little bit artificial in a way, but to stimulate the flow of a conversation about different topics. Um, so uh, what we had to do, and I think most of us had to do this with the transition to online teaching, is we had to find a way to move the activities that we do in the face-to-face -face teaching into an online context. And um, one of the most difficult things, I think, is listening in both face-to-face -face and online. When you're in a face-to-face -face classroom, it's very easy to do activities such as reading the text to the students. They have to listen. The students are reading the text to each other. Uh, you play textbook recordings. And I, I think that's one of the things with a lot of classroom-based language teaching is the, the, the sheer presence of the students in the room sort of validates, validates the educational experience. We can say they were in the room, we did the activities, and we hope for the best given the different context. When we're online, especially asynchronous or on demand, not live teaching, how do, we, how do we control that? And I don't mean control in a very controlling sense, but like, how do we know what happens out there online when the students are on their own? And that is one of the biggest struggles, I think, when trying to create asynchronous activities for textbooks or from, for regular classes. So this is one of our challenges. And the key issues that we were thinking of is, as uh, it says at the bottom of my screen, how do you create and deliver the content or the recordings to the students? How do you confirm student completion? Because if there isn't some sort of 
teeth to the activity. If they think that you are not checking, if they think that there's no confirmation, they're a lot less likely to do it. How do you assess the student effort? Uh, do you want to grade? Do you want to give feedback? Do you want to base it on completion? Uh, some of my required classes, literally attendance equated completing a PDF activity. So these are a lot of different topics to think about. And the last one about grading and feedback, about how you're going to grade and um, how you're going to give feedback. Uh, David, I'm sorry, I'm talking a lot. Uh, you want to jump in on anything? Um, yeah, it, it seems pretty good. I mean, we both had different, a uh, little bit different ways of uh, doing those different things, especially uh, confirming student completion. Uh, Rich, I, I think you were saying to me in this course, uh, you weren't checking for attendance, uh, but my university required me to do that in some way. Uh, so I did have uh, deadlines in place for uh, one of the assignments. Um, but yeah, you, you handled it a little bit differently than me. Uh, right. But, yeah, and I think that's, more that's what, I, out there. what I spoke to earlier in that um, for many of us, we have unique teaching situations. And so I want to try to cut to sort of the, the main idea of what we did that might make it useful for people. So uh, let's look a little bit at my class that I had. So the activities that I created um, to replace the more traditional things, uh, we did have a Zoom class meeting, but it was optional. Attendance was okay at the beginning, but then it rapidly dropped, dropped off throughout the semester. We used the Flipgrid video app where students had to make selfie videos asking and answering the questions. There's pros and cons to that, but we're not here to talk about that. Um, we use MS uh, Microsoft Forms, which we are going to talk about. I also tried David's Forms from Google Forms because his was different and it was a way to uh, add some variety to the class. Um, I used Quizlet, the flashcard website and smartphone app uh, with the unit content. And I created this content so the students could study it. Uh, they weren't required to, but it was you know, a resource for them to use. And then and at the end, we had a uh, multiple choice test, um, which wasn't great, but I had to have a test. So <laughs> there might be better ways to do it, but I was scrambling for, uh, for answers. So let's focus on the Microsoft Form listening activity. So as I said, in class, you, you play it or you know, they read it or the sums up, but how do we deal with it on the online situation? So my idea was that um, similar to the textbook, um, my wife and I recorded more extended or more extensive conversations about the topic using more vocabulary, but we also tried to use our teacher voices so that the English was perhaps easier to understand for my lower level students. Uh, the textbook recordings are sometimes almost too native level. Uh, they are challenging, but perhaps a little too difficult. Um, the other idea was that the form was a template so that I could easily recycle it with um, just by basically changing the title. So I wanted a form that would work for all of the different uh, audio recording so that I minimized the amount of time and effort that I had to put in because I think a lot of us found that teaching online can easily take a lot more time than face-to-face -face teaching. Uh, so the students would listen, uh, sorry, the in Microsoft Teams, which my university used, um, we I put the assignments there and I'm going to show you how these things look uh, in just a few moments or a few minutes. Um, the students would listen to the audio recording, which was through uh, Google Drive in this situation. And then uh, they had to um, write what did they hear into the uh, Microsoft form. And in my case, the grading was based on completion. If they did it, they got credit for the homework assignment. This wasn't a big assignment, um, but it was supposed to replace a more traditional face-to-face -face activity. And I didn't, I didn't see an easy way to grade it without taking a lot of time and effort. So I decided just to make it a completion-based activity. Uh, this is what um, Microsoft Teams, uh, this is actually on an iPad. So the format is slightly different, but it's still basically the same if it's the um, website. This is what it looks like under the hood of when I would create uh, the assignment in Microsoft Teams. Uh, it has a title. It has the um, instructions, which in this case would have the links to the uh, audio recording. And then there's also the form. 
And uh, in this case, I didn't have points and I would set the deadlines and then I would assign the assignment to the students. And then when it became available to the students, they would click on the activity and they would come to a form that looks like this. And um, they had to type their name. And the reason I had them type their name in English is because my university's Microsoft team system had the students' names recorded in kanji or the Japanese characters. And my Japanese kanji skills are not good enough for names. So I quickly learned that I needed to have the name in English so that it was easier for me to see who did it or who didn't do it. And then the question boxes, uh, there were 14 in this case, one each for uh, the questions that were answered from the 13 questions in the textbook. The students had to summarize the answers. Some of them wrote very minimally. Some of them wrote uh, almost perfect transcriptions. Some of them even wrote in Japanese, uh, which I had to persuade them not to do because it's not a Japanese class. And um, so, while we um, have that, I wanted to jump quickly out of screen sharing um, into Microsoft Teams to show you a little bit of what um, it might look like. So these are the tiles that represent my classes. This is a test class that I often use. Um, and so in this situation, when I made uh, a listening activity, for, and posted it into the general channel. And again, I'm, I'm not gonna teach you how to use Teams tonight. We don't really have enough time. So there are other ways to do this with other LMSs, but it's basically the same process. So if you view the assignment, this would be where the students would appear. Uh, their names would appear here with a status. I'd be able to give them feedback. I'd be able to look at their answers, et cetera. Now, if I wanted to look at the activity, I would open this in forms. But, Rich, um, do you want to share the screen? Oh my goodness. Screen? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh no. Uh, I've only been doing this, you know, a year and a half now or a year. So anyway, sorry, let me back up one there. So again, this is uh, the tiles for the teams and this is the test class. And this is what the activity would look like um, when the, uh, what the students would see. Um, and then if I wanted to create a new file activity, there's a couple options that you can do. Um, you can create a quiz uh, from forms directly. You can recycle, you also can open a new quiz. And then within quiz, you can give it a title, for example, this is a test, a description, and then you can add a question. And then here, similar to Google Forms, you can choose what type of question do you want? Do you want a choice like ABCD? Do you want um, them to type an answer? Uh, you can add how many answers, you can give it a point value, you can make it a long answer or a short answer, you can make it required. Again, these are pretty similar between the different systems. And then you can add uh, another, in this case would be a multiple choice, but that's not what I was doing. I was doing the, um, the long answer where the students needed to type their activities. So um, that is sort of the main idea is this allowed me to easily create the audio recordings, distribute it in an assignment in Microsoft Teams. The students accessed it, listened to it, typed their answers, and then gave it back to me. And then I assessed it based on completion. And that was the, the simple way, the, one of the simplest way I found to be able to create out of class listening activities with some kind of teeth, again, that's the phrase I use, that encourage the students to actually do the work. So I'm gonna jump back to here. And then I think, uh, do you want me to run the slides from this end, uh, David? Oh, I can take over screen share. Okay, sure, let's that's do okay. that. All right. Hey, it's the invisible guy. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share mine. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm teaching at Hokkaido Univers University of Education uh, last year, and also um, this year I'll be teaching there again. Um, so basically, just like Rich, uh, we had um, optional Zoom classes, and just like Rich's situation, uh, the attendance was very good at the beginning, and then one students figured out that they didn't have to come, or um, they just dissipated <laughs> over time. Um, I, I still had a few that would come and 
they were very religious about coming every every week and that was good to have some attendance but most of them just needed to do the um the, uh, the assignments to complete the course so that's what they did uh we also had uh the quizlet uh flashcards which rich had already made you know he'd been using this textbook in previous years uh leading up to online so uh, he already had those Quizlet cards uh, ready before the semester was even started. Uh, I also used Flipgrid for speaking activities, so that was their speaking portion of the class. And I had two different Google Forms activities. I used one directly from the textbook, the textbook's questions, and also with the textbook's audio. And this was more of a focused or controlled activity. And then I had an extra listening activity, which, which kind of, it was purpose to build on top of that. So it was more of an applied learning situation. Uh, and our semester was quite short. So we covered about 10 units in a 13 week semester. Uh, usually you'd have 15 in Japan. Um, okay, let's go to the next one here. All right, so first we'll look at the um, standard listening activity. So this is the first activity. I use the textbooks audio recording. So um, on their website, you can actually download all the recordings. Uh, so you, you can get the textbook and then actually on their website, they have the, uh, on EFL Press website, they have all the recordings for the textbook. And I slowed down the tempo to 85% because I thought the speakers, you know, they were native, they were speaking a little bit too fast for uh, my Japanese students in, in my context. Um, I, I thought it would be a little too fast for them. So I slowed that down. Uh, there were multiple choice or checklist questions. So Rich's was open answer. Uh, mine were multiple choice or checklist. So more than one answer sometimes. And I used a Google form template, which was also recycled. So I kept uh, the first half of it the same, basically with all of the, uh, you know, fill in your name, your student ID. I kept that all the same. And then the questions and answers were changed out. Um, and these were uh, posted in Google Drive. So I, I can kind of show you a little bit of how I did that and how you could do it in your own context. Uh, so students would listen to audio recordings and then it would answer the textbook questions. Um, normally in a textbook, you'd have just a, a couple different answers. I would sometimes try and make it a little more difficult. So I'd add in a few more um, distractions to um, or distractors to kind of make it a little more uh, difficult than the textbook. And uh, I used this one for attendance. So they were supposed to complete these activities every week uh, by Friday night. Okay, so here is a look at what the activities looked like. So this is the first half of the sheet. Um, basically the instructions are here. Um, I'll, I'll just show you that a little bit later how you can construct this. And later on, we have the student ID. They enter that in, their family name, their first name. The reason I did this is because I was not connected to an LMS with this. Unlike Rich, whose system was uh, already built in with all the student IDs and all the names and kanji, I didn't have any of that. My LMS was, was very um, not good for, for my use case. So I did not, I tried to stay off of it as much as possible. So these activities were available through a Google Drive folder, which I shared with the students. Um, and I shared a new folder every week for the new assignments they would uh, get. And uh, they would even choose their class here. And later on, that would make it easier for me to sort in the Google Sheets, which is kind of like Excel. Uh, I could sort out the students' information using this information here. Uh, I could find their data. Okay, and this is the second half. This is kind of what the questions would look like. So question one, which was in the textbook. Uh, so um, do, you, you know, do you have any brothers or sisters? So the first one, yes, I do, or no, I'm an only child, I'm an only child. And then question two, I would give instructions. For example, you know, there's gonna be more than one answer. And then this is a checklist type. You can see with the boxes here. Okay, and I think this question was, how old are your brothers and sisters? Okay, so they could check my brother is 31 and my sister is 33. And if there was another sister, uh, my sister is 34. All right, so next, uh, yeah, this is me with a beard. Okay, so I had the extra listening activities. Uh, and I also used the same kind of template. So I used a Google Forms uh, for this as well. And this was done using Zoom. 
I had a coworker who was just very gracious, very kind, and we worked together uh, during that crazy semester. Uh, and we created these extra listening uh, videos for students to watch. And we recorded through Zoom. We were not in the same place. We were actually in different parts of Sapporo. And we recorded and uploaded to YouTube. And I shared that video and I embedded it um, into a Google form. And those were also available in the Google Drive folders. And students would watch those and uh, answer questions. And that grade was based on their performance. So here is a quick look at what those activities looked like. So this first part probably looks pretty familiar, except the instructions. Instructions were a little bit different. Uh, so this week, David is asking Alicia about her family. So watch the video below and answer the questions. And Google Forms make it, makes it very easy to upload a video from YouTube. Uh, it's not easy to do other types of uh, videos. So you would uh, probably have to upload something to YouTube on your personal account or uh, the link to a, uh, another video. So for example, if you wanted to use TED Talks videos, uh, you could upload that link from the video into Google Forms and they would be able to watch it in Google Forms. Okay. All right. So actually before that, I too just want to jump in really quick and um, let's see here. Okay, is everyone there still? Okay, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just share a little bit about how to construct a Google Forms activity. I need to move this out of the way, excuse me. And, okay, here we go. Now I can get to it. Okay, so this is kind of what um, the activities would look like inside of a Google Form, a uh, Google Drive folder. So textbook homework, extra listening. Okay, and then here is an untitled form. That was the form I didn't start working on, but here. So if you do a double click inside of Google Drive, you can make a Google a new Google Forms activity. Um, you could also go to forms.google.com and you could go from there. Um, but let's go ahead and just show a little bit about what, what it looks like at the beginning of constructing an activity here. So, so here we have an untitled form. So here you can add your title in. So you can say you know, lesson one or unit one. Okay, you can give a little description here and then you already have a question ready for you to type out. And this is um, defaults to it multiple choice. So if you click on it, you have many options here to do checkbox, drop down. Okay, and you can add questions here. You can import questions. So if you've already made some sheets, uh, you can recycle them and put them in from another, uh, another form that you've created. Um, here's one to add a title and description. You can add images and add a video. So this is how I did it with the um, extra listening activities. So you can search the video on YouTube, or if you have the URL, you can just type it right in there. Okay. And of course, if you want to, you can go ahead and put a URL right into here if it's not a YouTube link. So then they could click on that URL, take them to the video or the audio you want them to listen to or watch, and you can go from there. Um, one more thing I wanna show is how to share these activities. So you can email them to specific students. That would be a very long process depending on how many students you have. Um, also, you can just share a link to the activity or you can embed it into a LMS. So if you use this code here, you could actually put this, if, you're, if your school is using Moodle, for example, you can actually embed these activities into the LMS itself. So that helps it just to be all in one system. All right, so that's about it for that. David, right. can you tell them a little bit, how did you, um, how did you receive the students' answers? Oh, sure. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, so to show that well, I'll go ahead and just go into another. Um, so this is actually one that I've got responses into. Uh, it's no longer accepting responses. But once students are, you know, they complete the work, you, you have your questions. So this is your this is your worksheet, right? This is your one that you're sharing with them. And here are all the responses. So when the students complete it, it tells you how many, 
And it's a really cool system here. You can see what the average grade was. You can even see what a frequently missed question was. So for example, question eight, um, only 56 of them had it correct in this case. So it's, it's very good. Um, you know, if you wanted to you could go back and, you know, figure out like, oh, I made a mistake with that question and you could make it a little bit easier for, for students if you catch it quick enough. Um, David, but yeah, real quick, so, in terms yes. of the exported answers to the spreadsheet, mm -hmm. is it possible? Oh, sure. to them, but, but wait, 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 wait. My only concern is that if the spreadsheets have students, uh, students numbers, that could be confidential uh, yeah. information. Right, right. So yeah, I wanted I would, to catch you yeah. there. Right. So I'm not really going to go there, but yeah, um, you'll have this option here that you can either create a new sheet. This one already has a sheet attached to it, a Google Sheet. So if I click on this one, it would open up um, basically an Excel spreadsheet with all the uh, students' information, which you can sort by class. Um, of course, if you're working with Google Classroom, you wouldn't need to do that extra step so much because all of those grades would be automatically put into a grade book for your school. Right. And I, I think what's interesting about the, about the spreadsheet with the Google Forms is that in my case, when I was looking for um, completion, not uh, a score or a grade, you can easily scan mm -hmm. uh, the spreadsheet of the students' answers and names, and you can easily identify who didn't do the work Okay. Which does yeah. a lot. So you don't have to worry. You're not, you're, not, you're not grading who did it. You're checking who didn't do it. And usually that's a minority. And that allows you to do, um, to keep track of grading. Although, as you said, now Google Forms does work pretty seamlessly with Google Classroom. So yeah. if you're yeah. using Google Classroom, you can have this, um, the grades basically automa automatically imported into your grade sheet yeah. for Google Forms. Yes. Yeah. So for me, I, I had to do it the old school way of just sorting out Excel by, um, uh, you know, by the class they were in, doing a little bit of uh, formula work, putting in formulas to sort them out. And then the other thing was uh, I was using the textbook homework for attendance. So but that's actually very good because there's a timestamp on there for all the work. So I was able to see the line where everything after this was linked. So they would get a lower attendance grade or a zero score. Okay, cool. Thanks for catching that. Okay, so Rich, do you want to go to, or actually, I'll just go to the last slide. Yeah, why don't, why don't you do that? Okay. Um, let's see here. Sorry, if I go to share screen and, oh, I see. Okay. Okay, here we go. No. No? I mean, I see you. I don't, I don't see the slide. Oh, really? You don't see me? Okay, Rich, why don't you do it then? I'm seeing we have a problem. <laughs> no problem. I'll, I'll share a screen, and then I will go back to the slides. And um, let's see here. I have to get my system to catch up. Why is it, hold on a second, I'm gonna refresh my screen. It seems to be, it's hanging, isn't one it? moment, please. <laughs> yeah. Technology, it always seems to do this right when you're uh, in the middle of, maybe, uh, are you doing, let me see, hold on, let's check here. Let me real quick, I'm gonna jump over here, see if I can refresh the form. It doesn't seem, hold on a second, okay. let me reopen it. Ah, okay, there we go. Got it. Thank, thank you for your patience, everyone. And we'll go down here to, I believe this is the last one. There we go. Uh, right, so um, that's kind of the main idea of what we did uh, as trying to find an easy way to create asynchronous listening activities out of the classroom. Um, there are other ways to do this. Uh, but this was one of the best ways that we found, I guess. And um, some of the takeaways or the things about moving forward that uh, we want to consider. As you probably heard some of the discussion about using different systems like Quizlet, Flipgrid, Google, Microsoft. Um, it, 
became very overwhelming in terms of time and effort. And one thing that I did the second semester is I pulled everything back inside of the Teams LMS. I, I didn't do Flipgrid videos. Um, I didn't do external things because it was creating too much work on my part. And as much as I liked the activities and thought that they could be valuable, in the end, it was too much work for me and trying to juggle all the systems with the students and troubleshoot just became, uh, became way too much too quickly. Um, one nice thing about Zoom, and there are of course other, you know, there's Google Meets and other things, but with the ability to make the recordings of the screen, which makes both video and audio video, uh, audio recordings, as David did with his teacher friend, he was able to create these videos of the two people talking in a very natural human way. And that I think allows us to um, create better content for our students that might support the curriculum, support the textbook. Um, and also one nice thing about Zoom is it sort of opened our eyes to the possibility that we can reach out to people around the world and one idea I thought would be to, uh, to make recordings of people um, with different Englishes, you know, people from India, people from Australia, people from Britain that have, you know, they're all speaking English, but in their own unique ways. And that would allow us to expose our students to um, some really interesting alternatives. And with social media and the connection of Zoom now, it's significantly easier, but it's also mentally that it's open the possibility. I could have done these things before, but because I was always doing it in the traditional classroom book sense, it never occurred to me to do this. And so I, I think that's been a really nice thing that's opened a lot of our eyes to the possibilities. And so in that sense, I'd like to implement this in my future face-to-face -face teaching to save class time. So instead of having the students listen to the CD or listen to me reading a text because we're required to do a listening activity, I'd like to push these activities outside of the classroom where the students can do it because it is, you know, it is in a such a, a solitary activity. It's not a group activity. And I think in that way, we could save ourselves a lot of time. So I'm planning on using Microsoft Teams this coming school year, even, even if we go back to face-to-face, to try to use these activities uh, to save class time. David, any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, it's great. Um, you know, so you're saving the time so that you can really focus on things that are you can only do in the classroom, like face-to-face -face conversations among students um, or whatever else you want to do in the class. But yeah, all that listening stuff is done outside. Um, yeah, that's something too I'll probably carry on using even when we get back to face-to-face -to -face classes. All right, can so I guess- can I, can, I, can I add an idea? Because sure. like- you... Oh, what's the idea, Penny? You cut out? Uh, looks like she's frozen. Oh, okay. Welcome back, Penny. Hi, everyone. Okay, I can hear someone. Is that Penny? Hi, I'm really, really sorry. My internet connection collapsed. Thank God I wasn't the only host of the event. So um, uh, I, was, I was just saying, uh, because Richard is right, like listening is a solitary activity. Um, because now we move to face-to-face -face teaching, I asked all of my students to bring in their headphones. And this is something I tested like last semester. So uh, students can bring in their headphones and can listen uh, to any video or listening activity we have like individually in class. And because I don't think when we listen to a lecture like in a plenary mode, it's, it's not successful. They don't pay attention for some reason. They don't take effective notes. So if they just listen on their own, I think that's much more successful. I don't know if everyone any in any university have ever used that, but I used it like last semester and it was really, really useful. Yeah, I think, I think the, um, it does. And, and I think that's sort of, I mean, I think uh, Natalie said that they did that in 
2019. And I think, you know, some people have realized that beforehand, but I think the, the whole online transition thing has forced us to consider other options. Like for example, my university had Microsoft Teams before COVID-19, but I had a negative impression of Teams. I really, I didn't like it. I didn't think it was good. I didn't think it would work. Uh, I don't know why, to be honest, but I was forced to use Teams and I was like, oh, it's actually not that bad. And then I learned that, you know, there are some very good things in having an LMS once you needed to rely on an LMS. So I think it's been good for a lot of us to force us to open our minds to uh, different teaching options. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And I think taking out of the classroom, you know, those time consuming listening activities and lectures and everything, especially in EAP, when you have to watch a 15 minute TED talk, honestly, I don't think they will get the meaning of the, of the, of the TED talk within 15 minutes. And if they listen to it only once, most of the times I need to play the listening activity twice. And what was very, very interesting about your presentation, for example, here in China, I don't have the option of uh, Google Forms. And that's very, very frustrating. Like my only option is Microsoft Forms. And instead of using Google Drive, you need to use OneDrive. So it's, it's, it's a very good thing we, we were like um, able to have both. Yes, Richard, come on guys, if you have like any questions, that would be nice. Um, let me, I had a question, a personal question. Uh, what about the students' reaction? I mean, they were forced to do it. Did they enjoy it? Um, technically, uh, it was easy for them to access the forms. Did you have like, did you have multiple emails from students asking, uh, how can I do this? How can I do that? Yes, I had, I had everything. I mean, I had students that, you know, immediately were able to engage and complete the activities. I had some that struggled the entire time either to complete the activity or, for example, to not write the answers in Japanese. I, you know, I explained in English, I explained in Japanese, etc. yet it continued to happen. And, you know, it's difficult because you, you often don't have the face-to-face the, the -face interaction in the classroom. It's often difficult to figure out what's actually going on with that student specifically. And if you have larger classes or many classes, it's easy to lose those students and just say, well, you know, I can't, I've tried, but there's nothing more that I can do. So uh, it's, it's definitely a tough situation for teachers. I think training students how to use uh, those new applications we create. For example, I've created like a series of screencasts for my students this semester. And I have uploaded a screencast, for example, how we use Padlet, how to access the Padlet link I sent you and how to add content in the Padlet. So I created like a very detailed uh, screencast and I posted my videos through Panopto in my LMS, which is Moodle. So I am now that we're very, very deep in technology, I think we need to really, really think about how to train our students. So maybe screencast is a solution. I don't know, this weekend I'm going to test that but it's, it's very, very frustrating when you create something and then students don't respond. That's why I asked you. Um, what about you, David? Did you have like those questions from students? Did, did they have like uh, a problem to access the material? Yeah, I didn't have too many questions from students. Uh, I mean, Japanese students tend to be a little, maybe a little shyer than students from other countries, perhaps. Um, other than that, they, they just were silent. I just had a silent group of students that um, I, 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 if I got their email once, I would try and contact them. So actually I sent out a survey at the beginning of the semester to find out about their uh, comprehensiveness with, with computer tasks, uh, what their preferences were for learning. Uh, you know, I, I had 10 questions and I even gave them a couple of ways to express 
through writing in Japanese. I encourage them to write in Japanese. Uh, and I would just translate it with Google because I'm, I'm good like that. <laughs> so that's how I'd usually do it. So I'd have them write it out in Japanese and I would just use a translation software on the browser and just translate their, their, um, their feedback. And uh, I, I think that first contact was good to do, to, to reach out to them just to see what their concerns were with the class. Because at the time, you know, it was going to be going online and they weren't expecting it. Uh, it was a delayed semester. So, yeah, I, I would just suggest uh, trying to get those feelers out to try and um, connect with them with it out of, out of, outside of homework. So, so the first thing is to just to try and just get their feedback about what they think. I think that's important. What was like their main concern? What was like the most common problem they faced? I think it was just um, pro probably that everything, you know, a lot of things were in English. So I, I tried to uh, make it as easy as possible. So things that I could put in Japanese, I did. Uh, my wife's Japanese. So I, I, I asked her for a lot of advice because she was a college student. So I asked her, you know, you know, where's a good place to, to help them with Japanese? Because I didn't want to make everything Japanese, but I wanted instructions when necessary to be in Japanese for them, to make them feel a little more comfortable. Um, so yeah, perhaps not in you know, your context in China or elsewhere, it may not be as much of an issue and, uh, and they might be easier to tell you what, what's wrong. Uh, I, I did have some students that even with their email, I could not connect with them. Like I, I would send them an email and they just never got back to me. So I, I didn't know what to do with, with some of those students. Uh, but a good majority of students finished the first semester uh, with flying colors. And so that was good to see. Okay, okay, that's nice. Because, okay, for example, yes, switching back to Japanese or Chinese, it's, it's an easy solution uh, to overcome problems and actually, okay, get to the point. But like, um, I, I'm, I'm doing, I'm using a lot of technology in the classroom as well. And I can imagine how difficult it was from you to, to coordinate that from far away. Because when you are in the classroom, you can go to their laptops and actually show them what to do. Yeah, yeah. But when you are far away, I can't imagine how difficult it must have been. Because, you know, sometimes people think, oh, Google Forms, Microsoft Forms, Padlet, that's very easy. Everyone knows that. And now that... I'm, I've started like training people and introducing things to my students. No, not everyone knows about Microsoft Forms. Right, right. So actually I made a um, tutorial video. I, I recorded it on my iPad and I just did a screen, screen grab or screen recording on my iPad of me walking through a Google Forms activity. I also did this with Flipgrid because I used it for speaking activities. And those were available from the first, you know, before the semester started, like in the first week, before we had assignments. Uh, the first week was just getting them into the class. So yeah, tutorial videos, I, I would recommend that to walk them through things and just try and think what they might have a struggle with and ask your Japanese yeah, friend or, or your Chinese friends for help. You know, well, you know what, exactly. what might be a stumbling block for them? I think there's exactly, you know, some... It's, it's, it's our obligation, sorry Richard, I think it's not only for us to teach them English or critical thinking skills or lecture listening skills, I think it's one of the things we should teach them, it's digital literacy. I mean, they know how to use their smartphone, mm -hmm. but they don't know how to do other things. Mm. Right, well actually, so I think there's one thing, the, the uh, online teaching Japan, the Facebook group that, that we're both in, there's been a discussion lately, I think that's very significant, very telling to this. And there's been this image of, uh, it's basically saying, it's criticizing students and say, oh, you, you can't do the LMS homework, but you can do TikTok, right? So why? And it's sort of dismissive of the students, but some people have pointed out that TikTok is a huge corporation with millions of users and they are a business who have designed their interface and their entire system so that it's easy to use and it's fun to use because that monetizes the process. Most of our LMSs, Google Classroom, Microsoft Teams are horrible. 
the user interface design is really, really bad. It's very clunky. It's difficult to understand. I mean, adult English teachers struggle to use these systems. So to expect these students who have even less digital experience to quickly embrace these horrible systems in the same way that they embrace TikTok is really not a fair comparison. And, and also research shows that, you know, the whole, it, it's basically a myth about the digital natives that young people are better at technology than old people. And that's actually not really true. Some students are better, but there's a lot of students because of socioeconomic problems or learning disabilities that are not good with technology. And sort of saying that all young people are digital natives uh, is troublesome. Exactly. You do have to Richard, be I'm a millennial and it took mm -hmm. me a month to find out how to set up a meeting on Teams. I'm not, from, I'm not a friend with Teams. From mm -hmm. this morning, like Zoom is banned in China, I cannot schedule a meeting. So uh, I need, like I'm forced to use Teams. So before everyone goes, I would like to share uh, our next event. Don't go Richard and David. So before everyone moves, uh, moves on. Um, so we have scheduled all of our events until May. And Charlie Brown. Time, yes, exactly. Dr. Charles Brown. It was about time to host him here in Tulsig. Uh, he's a legend about corpora and vocabulary. I mean, he's going to share with us so many like websites and tools. I'm already using what he's doing in my classroom. And we're go going to share with you like Quizlet lists and, uh, you know, uh, placement tests. Um, I, you used Quizlet. I've introduced Quizlet in my course. So what's your opinion about that, Richard and David? Is Quizlet something that students actually use? Uh, well, I think, you know, one of the things as educators is we can introduce our students to different tools. And if it doesn't meet the students' needs, it doesn't matter how good you think it is. And so there's, so I personally, I love Quizlet. I think it's an amazing tool, but unless you present it well with good materials and in a way that supports their learning needs and goals, it's not necessarily going to connect with them. But because it is such a good system, it's very easy to do that compared to others. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, I, exactly. I, I, think, I think if you use it in the right ways, uh, basically for us, I think if it wasn't required, it wasn't usually done by the majority of students. Um, so if there was no way of checking if they'd done it, um, if we're not bothering them about it, um, you, you might have two students that will use those tools throughout the entire semester. Uh, otherwise, you have 10 or 20 that will use it, and then they'll just drop off. Uh, it, it could really work, though, with Quizlet if you have a class that's very vocabulary intense. Uh, I can see a very good use for Quizlet in that case. But my course wasn't. It was more of a conversational type thing where they want to know phrases, how to answer phrases. Uh, so in that in that case, Quizlet wasn't quite um, the right kind of tool in my uh, scenario. But I'm using, can. using I'm using Wood Richard. Any tips about Quizlet, Quizlet? But Quizlet can work very well as a teaching tool in the classroom as right. a way to review vocabulary, or there's a game called Quizlet Live, mm. which exactly, students really exactly. enjoy. So, so from a teaching point of view, it can be a useful teaching tool. Now, mm -hmm. whether it's a good study tool is something that's up to you and the students to negotiate. So there's sort of two different things going on with Quizlet. Yeah, I'm gonna use it with my English for specific academic purposes, like we're talking about environmental science students. So you need to explain to them right from the beginning, okay, these are the lists. For example, I have connected my Quizlet uh, word lists to the lecture, to the listening, to the reading they have to do that week. It's vocabulary they don't know. So if they don't do it, they won't be able to follow. So anyway, that's, that's a very big discussion. Thank you guys. Thank you guys very, very much. Uh, very informative session. Uh, guys, 
uh, thank you. We would like to thank everyone who attended this webinar. I like I received like a few messages right now, so I'm gonna post again the WeTransfer link with the certificate. Um, we are going to have like another webinar in March with Dr. Charlie Brown, and we are going to upload this recording on our YouTube channel. So thank you everyone, stay safe in Japan. Thank you very much for coming.